Welcome back to Melissa Hager TV. I am nervous, jittery, a little bit excited, but also like, oh my gosh, I don't know if I want to give away all my secrets. Uh, so I called in a, a super great friend of mine, somebody who I've actually been able to have very honest, fat conversations with. That is not something that happens between fat people because we all have a lot of <laughs> denial, <laughs> like we do. So this is uh, this could be a little triggered in this video. I will warn you, and uh, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. There could be a little cringeworthy too. <laughs> but we want to talk about what it's like to be super fat, what morbid obesity is like and what it does to your everyday life and, and what happens to your psyche. So please welcome my uh, soon-to-be thin, healthy friend, Nick. <laughs> hey, everybody. Um, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, there's definitely some um, some anxiety. The jiggles of truth are coming, and they're coming out of my pores. I'm so nervous. I know, me too. I can't believe we agreed to do this. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of regretting the idea. I mean, it's just... Uh, <laughs> It's, I don't mind the We're notion. laughing nervously. <laughs> yeah, because I, I don't mind the notion that, like, it's obvious that I'm big. You know, I feel like there's a stigma where, like, thin people kind of walk around eggshells around certain topics because mm -hmm. we're heavy. It's not like I went to bed a size two and woke up 400 pounds. I right. know that I'm big. You're not going to hurt my feelings by telling me something that I already know. And that sounds maybe arrogant for me to say that, but I really, that's the experience I've had. People, they'll be like, oh, um, I'm not sure if this chair is big enough to hold you. Like, oh, I'm well aware it's not big. It's made right. of wicker. Yeah. See, I know how wicker. it works. Oh, gosh, wicker furniture. The mm. worst. Okay, that already, like, wicker, ooh, they, you just triggered me. <laughs> wicker. <laughs> I hate wicker furniture, especially old wicker furniture. Oh, I know. That's a collapse waiting to happen. What's, what it is is kindling. So yeah. I, I look at it like, that's really expensive kindling for my bonfire because I'm never going to sit on it. You're right. You're um, right. The mm -hmm. second one are the the standard lawn chairs that are the metal frame, but they've got like the elastic banding that you they oh. supposed to hold your body. Mm -hmm. It makes me feel like a whale that's being moved from Sea World to the ocean. <laughs> like it just I sink into it, and the metal closes around me, and I'm I'm stuck like a partially burst open can of biscuits. Like it's just <laughs> it's absolutely terrible, and they're not comfortable. Definitely stuff we deal with on a daily basis, and it becomes part of who you are because your head game is so loud, Absolutely. and it's constant, and I just don't, someone who's been thin their whole life, I don't know that they even understand the stuff we have to think through to even proceed to the movies, to proceed to the restaurant, to proceed to go out of our house, like the amount of things that go through our head, like that this has to line up, this has to line up, this has to line up. Absolutely. So I don't look like an idiot. For me, it's it's everything's about emotion and feeling and the way it, I impact others. Like mm -hmm. I think part of the reason that I've always been a people pleaser is because I've been so big. Because you can't be fat and be mean. Like you have to have a give and take right, in right. life. So I've always like, yeah. Mean fat it. people are the worst. No, it's like it's I, they're the worst. I've met some mean fat people, and I'm like, oh no, two big things going against you. Exactly. I mean, like that's just a thing. It is, and, and I'm not saying that 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 thin people dislike fat people. I will never ever commit to that because I have most of my best friends and most treasured people are thin. But I will say that. Like in all things, there's aspects of being heavy that just people either don't consider or they consider the opposite. They tiptoe around certain topics, like it's going to make me uncomfortable or sad. Or, and I, you know, I appreciate that. I know they don't want to hurt my feelings, but I'm a firm believer that in any aspect of life, for growth to happen, it starts with a conversation. Mm -hmm. So it's no different than if you want to plant a garden, you have to pull the weeds and till the dirt. So I'm tilling the dirt. I, I'm a big guy. I've been heavy my whole life. Uh, What's your biggest? The biggest I've ever been. Um, I actually don't have a number for that. My scale stops counting at 450. And around my wedding, I would stand on it. And it, my biggest is error. It just said err. So, <laughs> I'm an error. Yeah. Woo! Um, and, and then it almost gives you a little of, like, error. Does it give you a little relief? Like, you just don't have to know what the number is? Uh, no, uh, I, no, it doesn't because there are certain aspects of being heavy that you don't realize are a problem until you're not heavy. Gotcha. And so for me, there was a good stretch, I'd say a year and a half, two years where like I physically, my existence was miserable, not emotionally, but at least I was in pain all the time. I go to work and I'd work for 10 hours, come home. By the time I get out of my vehicle, I could hardly walk. Like I'd have to hold on to the side of the truck mm -hmm. to walk around it because I was in so much pain. So that was during that era phase. That's when I got married. My, my entire honeymoon, I was so big. Like I, 
I was perpetually terrified my entire honeymoon that I wasn't going to be able to do stuff. I have been well over 300 pounds for a long time, but as soon as my scale said error, I was like, I must be close to, I'm probably like 255. Like, that was in my head forever, even though I had to keep buying bigger pants, I had to keep buying bigger shirts, but every time I'd get on that scale and it would say error, I'm like, I'm 255. Like, so we had kind of the opposite thing going on. Mm -hmm. I don't know, it just kept me... In a state of denial. There was a point in my life where I'd get on a scale and I'd go, okay, 350, no, nah, I'll never be 400, not 400 yet. And then I'd get 375 and I'd keep telling myself mm -hmm. that. And then I and then I went for a solid two years where I never got on a scale. Just pure laziness, mm -hmm. you know, not for any particular reason. But then when I did, I was 402 and I'm like, oh my Lord, I got to lose some weight. This mm -hmm. is... I, I'm officially a fat person because I've I always had the luxury of being very mobile. The bigger mm -hmm. I mean, when I was younger, the big as I was, I could do whatever I want, mm -hmm. uh, unless you know something I just didn't fit in. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, uh, Mean Streak at Cedar Point. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, then I hit 450, and that was the cutoff for my scale, and um, that that was terrifying for me. I, I'm actually kind of I feel like I'm I'm not shaking, but I feel like it because. 450 is 50 pounds away from 500. 500 is half of a thousand. Mm -hmm. And as heavy as I have been, that number didn't seem possible to me. Here, here mm -hmm. I am. This morning I got in the scale was 439. Yesterday I ate like a beluga whale. Like I ate so much garbage yesterday. That's what I do is I go real good a couple mm -hmm. weeks and I'll diet and I'll be great. And then I'll have a night where I just eat everything that's edible in the house. Mm -hmm. if, the, if the door handle's loose, watch out. I'm going to swallow it. Yeah. I appreciate your honesty. This summer, this last summer, Nick, I had, I cannot tell you how many times I caught myself getting out of a chair, grabbing the handle, and then standing up. And finally, one of my friends who has lost 150 pounds, she said, she pulled me to the side and she's like, you don't have to do that. And I'm like, do what? She's like, stop grabbing the handles like a fat person to stand up because yeah. you're afraid the chair's going to come with you. Absolutely. And I'm like... My whole life, the chair has come with me. Yeah. Like, my whole life. And if you're on cement and it's a metal-legged chair, it makes a ting, 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 like a super loud noise. And everyone it's notices. horrifying. Mm -hmm. It's horrifying. You become accustomed to it your your whole well, life. So for me, one of the biggest ones was the mental side. And I fight this every day of eating. So I love food. I work in food. Um, He's but, an amazing chef. Uh, chef Nick. Thank He's you. He's so good. I, I wish my willpower was as good as my ability. Because, <laughs> I know, I've had your desserts. Oh my God, they're so good. Um, but because of I've always had this mentality of, oh my God, that sounds so good. And I honestly learned that I equate all the motions to eating. So it's not that I generally eat more like per meal than the average person. I don't. But if I'm happy, I want to eat. If I'm sad, I want to eat. If, if something terrible happens or if I'm, if I'm hanging out with, with a good friend, all I want to do is get a good meal and talk. That's all I want to do is sit down and eat, put something in my mouth mm -hmm. and then have a conversation because um, for whatever reason, uh, everything just leads back to food for me. And so one of the things I've learned about myself is that I have developed this terrible habit of when I'm eating something really good, I want to eat it until I'm ready to burst. Mm -hmm. Like I just want as much of it as I can get. We'll take last night, for example, I have dinner. I made a, a filet mignon with um, some fondant potatoes and a carrot puree. It was simple and it was nice. It was elegant. We enjoyed it. And and that then sounds it, amazing. It is tasty. Kids went and did their own thing. I dropped my one son off at his friends, and my, my oldest was downstairs playing Xbox like teenagers do. And then I sat there. It's like 8 o'clock, and I'm by myself. My wife is out having a girl's night, and I'm just chilling there with the hound dog, look watching TV, and I'm watching TV, which means time to snack. And I did. I went and got a bag of potato chips, and... Um, had some of those, and then I had another cup of coffee, and I just was constantly putting things in my mouth. And I wasn't hungry. At no point through any of the next three hours was there a blip of hunger. It was boredom mm -hmm. because boredom is the number one thing for me. And I won't just eat a little bit. I have to find a way, like something to sustain myself or be fulfilled. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I've done. And one of the hardest things I never knew I had to learn was to realize that just because I want to eat doesn't mean I'm hungry. I can honestly tell you as a person. I've probably only felt actual hunger as an adult, like actually the feeling of hunger, maybe 10 times. I, I eat so often, even if it's just something small, I'm always drinking a cup of coffee like this, that I'm never actually hungry, ever. I eat out of, a, out of habit. And can you remember those times of being hungry? Like what emotion does that bring over you? Rage. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> I'm a, See, I, I get panicked. 
I get panicked when I'm hungry. Like, oh my gosh, I'm hungry. I'm panicked. But I've heard that also. Like, uh, you're angry. I not angry in the sense that I'm mad at anyone. Um, I am a giant baby. I'm not accustomed to pain. <laughs> so when my stomach hurts, I just I turn into a toddler. Growing up the way I did, and I had a good childhood, but uh, there was always a lot of, uh, you have to eat whatever's on your plate. Mm-hmm. Well, if you don't make your own plate, you don't learn how to make your own plate with uh, a sustainable amount of food. Not, right. oh, I love this, I want double this. Like an actual normal amount of food, you never really get familiarized with, with what that's supposed to be like. What's a serving? Yeah, what, that's a good mm-hmm. question. What is a serving? You know, right. People don't realize that all your favorite foods... And I'm going to use ice cream as my kryptonite. A serving of ice cream is a half a cup. Yeah, that's not much. The smallest portion you can buy at the store is six. Cu- it's like six servings. It's right. three cups. But it's hard for me to be in my 30s teaching myself how to be like a a healthy, normal adult when everything I've ever learned or experienced has been the opposite. Mm-hmm. And all the best foods are sold in bulk to be eaten in tiny portions. Mm-hmm. And so maybe I sound like a, like a crybaby or like a spoiled brat. Like, mm-hmm. I, I don't want to, but I, 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 it's hard. The lack of knowledge behind being obese. Like, I've had a couple people now say to me, since I've had weight loss surgery, I've had a couple people say to me, well, I'm just curious. I just want to ask, don't you think that if you would have just ate these small portions that you're eating now, you, w- you would have lost the same weight? Obviously. Mm-hmm. If you were if you were wired the way a thin person is, mm-hmm. you wouldn't be fat, which negates that whole conversation. Mm-hmm. Which also, I think, addresses the fact of how strong your mind is. And Absolutely. How, like, I've said it. I wish I could hook up an electric fence that goes in the doorway from my living room to my kitchen that starts at a certain time, like 8 p.m. Shot the electric, colors. Yeah, the electric fence comes on, and you can't go in there anymore without severe pain because I don't like pain either. It would keep me out of there. Like, I do. I sit there. I'm like, oh, kids are in bed. It's my turn. Like, I get the house to myself. I can make something that I want to eat that they won't get. And it's, cr- I mean, I had weight loss surgery, and I still find myself abusing it to the point of I could go backwards because of the mental power food has on my life that I I just don't think people understand. Like I just there is a large group of people that just don't get it because you wouldn't ask me that question if you really understood. Like 38 years I've spent morbidly obese. Yeah, I would have loved to just eat smaller portions. I would have loved to of. It's especially hard to do things when you don't realize that your mind is controlling your perspective on things. Great example is I love salad. You know, I could eat a giant salad and I will feel stuffed and I will physically feel full. But my mind goes, but you didn't have any dessert. Ah, me too. Um, oh. Did you know there's still ice cream in there? Yeah. And I start thinking about it. And it's not even like, it's like a nagging thought. Kind of like, oh, I should have did laundry before I went to bed. Mm -hmm. And then next thing I know, it's like screaming in the back of my mind. And it's Mm -hmm. all I could think about. And by the time it's all I could think about, I start justifying it. Well, if I don't eat it, no one else will. If Mm -hmm. I spent money on it, it was $12. I didn't want to waste that $12. Mm -hmm. I worked really hard. That's an hour's worth of my time. Blah, blah, blah. I'm in the kitchen, you know, cutting a slice of cake or getting some pudding or Mm -hmm. getting a bag of chips or I'm... I I'm ju- I justified it by the financial investment I made in my home to s- sustain my family like any parent does for mm-hmm. their children. I am now justifying it to to eat things that would have just, you know, went in the garbage. Mm-hmm. Even if even if it's the day I made it, if I know they're not going in the garbage for 5 or 6 days. Mm-hmm. You still think. I have now justified. Mhm. This is why I have to do it. Even though how many weight loss programs have we bought and never used? How many shakes, uh, like, I can't even tell you the amount of different shakes and potions and lotions I've bought and never used. I was fine wasting that money, Mm -hmm. but something that I can enjoy mentally and physically, (laughs) I'm like, oh, yeah, no, I'm definitely going to. I'm definitely going to finish that. Oh, yeah, because you don't want to throw it away. When you're depressed or when you're sad, you get to this, especially when you're heavy, you get to this uh, this this happy medium where you're not happy in life, but you're not hating it, and you just find contentment through food. What's it like going to a restaurant? When it comes to going to a restaurant, I'm usually forced with two options. No matter what the restaurant is, 
spend a lot of money on something really nice. Mm-hmm. Um, because the nicer restaurants tend to actually have better portions for you. Or mm-hmm. you go into a place where you get burgers and fries and coney dogs and it's super cheap and you get a ton of it. Mm-hmm. Mentally, my mind says, I got to get as much food as I can because I don't want to go home hungry. Mm-hmm. Because when you are heavy, going home hungry or going to bed hungry is a primordial fear, which is no relevance in logic. Mm-hmm. But that's what my head does. I got, oh, I want three Coney dogs and fries. Ooh, let's get some onion rings. We should have dessert too. $25 later, that's just the money I've spent on me. I'm right. stuffed and can't walk and I'm taking over, taking home half the food I purchased. Here's a male versus female thing again. Like going to a restaurant for me, it w- I would eat almost a whole meal before I went because I don't want to eat a bunch of food in front of everybody. I If I'm having a girl's night or I'm hanging out, I assume everyone's going to be watching how much I eat because I'm the biggest one in the group. So I'd eat almost a whole damn meal before I left because also I'm scared of being hungry. Mm. But then when I go there, I can get like side salad or and, and then when people are like, oh, come on. And then, and then I would have come up with this other excuse. Well, I'm saving room for drinking. We're drinking. So I have um, different fears in restaurants. Okay, so one is messiness. I'm a terribly messy eater. So some foods I flat out refuse to eat in public. Okay. I don't eat ribs, chicken wings, that kind of stuff. And the two of my favorite things in the world, mind right, you. Right, right. I will not, if, if it involves a sauce that can get in my clothes, I will not eat it. Like, I don't know if you Because that's like a typical fat person. They got is. stuff all over the yeah, front of them. It's never meeting the, t- the chair you're yeah. sitting on. No, um, <laughs> no, if your boobs isn't. don't catch it, your stomach's gonna <laughs> it's going to catch it. It's right there. And if yeah. not, your thighs will. You had a, an event here, like when you first got this mm-hmm. office, that like you had, I think it was from Lazy Dog or something. Mm-hmm. You, had, you had food in here. I wouldn't eat it. And it's not that it wasn't tasty. Mm-hmm. It was fine. Mm-hmm. But I. I know the stigma. Mm-hmm. And at that point, when I get sauce like on me, then I start to get anxiety. Like, what if someone notices? Mm-hmm. What are they thinking? Mm-hmm. And then, completely unrelated, if I hear like laughing in the background, oh God, people are laughing at me. And I start it freaking. goes. You think it's directly it at goes you? Straight to the mm-hmm. bone. Heaven forbid they're having a good time. Someone at the table told a joke. No, if you yeah. are conscious of something and you yeah, hear it's... laughter. It's you. Yeah, because at that moment, you're the center of the universe mm-hmm. because you're the big, fat, fatty where the gravity, everything is pulled towards you. And even though. Nine times out of ten, you know you're being ridiculous. Mm -hmm. It still wins. When you go into the restaurant, do you scan the room real quick to see if you can find anyone bigger than you? That was always a thing. I would, like, take a quick scan, and then in your mind, you're just like, okay, I'm the biggest person in the room. I did this a lot from stage, doing stand-up comedy. When I come out on stage, I had to stop myself because it would start messing me up. Mm -hmm. But I would scan the audience, and I'm like, hmm, all the dudes and the girls, I'm the biggest person in this room. I... I did that, I consciously have done that a couple times, but for me, I tend to scan the room for the easiest routes of mobility, because Mm -hmm. I'm so big, I I do not want to squeeze in between chairs and bump into other Mm -hmm. people, and my one of my biggest fears in the world, and I don't know why, because usually people are very kind and courteous, is I hate walking behind someone and bumping their chair. Mm -hmm. It just, it horrifies me, Mm -hmm. and so I always look for the, like, if you go to, like, a buffet, I want... A table. I'll never sit in a booth, mm-hmm. and I want a table, and I want it as close to a, a walkway as possible, mm-hmm. so I can just hop up, and I'm not walking around people and bumping into them. And we, when we do weddings, I always send my thin servers in between people. <laughs> There's actually a venue, a comedy venue, that I never pursued because some friends of mine took me there to watch comedy, and it's down in a basement. It's in mm-hmm. Holly, and everything is tight, stacked, tight, tight. When we went there to watch a show, I was like. I'm never doing comedy here because the stage was all the way to the front and it was just a little cutout corner. You had to go through that entire room Uh to get up there. And I thought, there's no way. There's no way I'm ever going to be able to do comedy here. Well, they kept pressing me and pressing me and pressing me. Finally, I got a gig there. I'm serious. The whole time that people were coming in, ticket holders, and they were getting seated, I had a pathway eyeballed like laser vision. Oh, and yeah. anyone that got sat in that pathway, I would go up and I'd touch them. I'm like, hey, listen, I'm the first comic up. Can you just like scoot in a little just till I get by? I'm That's just worried about getting by. Incredibly brave. How did I? Do that. Uh, yeah, but like, do you think that that aisle of people even listened to anything I said? Of course not. Because they were like, this chick is like, crazy i hate stadium seating for that Mm -hmm. reason all the big old venues when you go to watch a show 
most of them have got those those hard plastic with the steel frame chairs that are just molded in place. They don't move. And if you're a big person... And they it, have handles. Yeah, they, yeah, they don't move. Mm-hmm. So if you're as big as I am, you either squeeze your hind end into this or you sit on the very tip just so you can look like you're sitting down to watch a show. Mm-hmm. And then and your legs, your quads are burning because you're like, your yeah. legs are holding you up. You're doing air chair essentially with yeah. like, you know, five pounds of you being helped. Mm-hmm. And um, some of my favorite things we, we've done in the past, we used to go to, a, before COVID, we'd go to see the a Monster Gym. And I love Monster Trucks. Mm-hmm. I like any kind of auto sports every year. And um, that was terrifying. Every year we'd go and I'd go, okay, here we go again. This is going to be miserable because you're squatting in that position and your knees are all cockeyed to weird angles. And, and, and if you're lucky, no one wants to walk by you. But someone always will. And I'm mm-hmm. not knocking them for wanting to enjoy what they paid money for just like you did. I, it's just – it's horribly uncomfortable. And it, it, it takes a lot of enjoyment away from something mm-hmm. that is literally only ex- in existence – for you to pay money to be happy. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's lots of small concert venues like that. And um, I'll tell you, one of my favorite things that ever happened was when movie theaters started putting those big old luxury recliners mm-hmm. in there. Mm-hmm. Um, yes. That that made movie going far mm-hmm. more enjoyable, far more enjoyable for me. And it sounds selfish, but that kind of stuff is, it weighs on you. And yeah. it, it definitely influences your decision to go do stuff with your family. Mm-hmm. Like, well, you kind of go pre-scope it out. I got to a spot where, like, I I, I was, during the week, a stay-at-home mom with two kids who want to go do fun stuff. And I want to support local things. Well, you kind of go start scoping things out before you actually do it. There's a big festival that happens in the wintertime um, here in our town. And I got asked... <clears throat> to be in a like celebrity dunk tank and I was so thrilled and honored I remember I couldn't even speak because I know some of the other people that have been in that dunk tank and I'm like I can't believe they even put me in that group so I hung up the phone and I started google searching dunk tanks well have you ever seen that little seat that you sit on and I'm well over 300 pounds at this point most of the dunk I google I'm serious there's a search in my phone that is what is the weight limit on dunk tanks most of them are two or two fifty, mm-hmm. and I was like, "There's no way I am not going to be in front of this massive crowd of people." And I keep triggering the dunk tank just because of my size. I can't even sit up there and enjoy the fun of it because I would be freaking out. And did I tell them any of that? No, hell no. I was like, "Oh, I'm sorry, I have a gig that weekend," uh... and then it just like turned me into a big fat liar. And I and I was just like, "I oh." I hated that. I had went to a, a water park, and I used to love like theme parks and amusement parks mm-hmm. and water parks, and I, I just, I, I to this day love that kind of stuff. If, if something involves having fun, I'm your guy. I jumped in the water slide, and I never realized how being big really affected my life until that moment. And I got halfway down, and I just stopped. I had to wiggle my big butt all the way, you know, down, down the and, slide, and I finally got out. And I, I never, I've never been um, on one since. Maybe you want to go on a, an airplane ride. You had to buy two seats because you're too big for one. Mm-hmm. My whole traveling career, I've always gotten on the plane and asked for an extension. Like I just find a flight attendant to make eye contact with, and it's like I need because I don't want someone to see me in the seat struggling. I'd rather just <clears throat> take it with me, buckle it, and buckle my belt. Everyone has different insecurities, mm-hmm. and for big people, the things that that we deal with a lot of things people would never comprehend Mm -mm. and that does go both ways Mm -hmm. there's lots of things that thinner people deal with that i will i'd like to understand someday (laughs) but as of right now i am yet to be uh, enlightened um (laughs) i've never been on a plane ride because of one of that's one of the key factors i always say that i'm scared of heights i'm not I'm scared of falling, but I'm not scared of heights. For me, that was a stigma I didn't want. I didn't want to be that guy that had to have two seats because mm-hmm. I couldn't fit to one. Um, I oftentimes have, in the past, not even worn a seatbelt in my truck because I didn't want to go buy the extension because of how big I am. It, it's there are some things in life that you have to do, and but when you're big and you're and you're and you're depressed about it or in denial you find reasons not to Mm -hmm. it takes the same amount of time to take weight off it does to put it on the difference is that putting it on is enjoyable Mm -hmm. it's fun to eat it gives you a sense of contentment for whatever the reason is whatever the the moment is it makes you happy working out does not um exercise does not cardio is the devil it's a necessary (laughs) devil but it's the devil 
And dieting does not. Even if you like all the food you still have to eat, mm-hmm. you, do, you still can't have ice cream. Mm-hmm. And so the reason I bring that up is because to, to put the work in to lose the weight the old-fashioned way, you are accepting the notion that I'm going to be miserable for as long as this takes. Mm-hmm. Until I can retrain myself to be a person, so mm-hmm. I can learn the things that I should have learned a long time ago and change all my bad habits, I'm going to be perpetually, perpetually miser- miserable. I meet workout buffs all the time that say mm-hmm. how much they love working out. They're like, if I don't work out, I don't feel good. Like, I work out because it makes me feel good. I look forward to that alone time at the gym every day. Mm-hmm. I love my at-home workout um, program because it makes me feel good. And I'm like, man, how do you get there? How do you get there? Cause that is not how I feel. I'm like, Oh, I said I was going to the gym three times this week and it's now Thursday and I haven't went once. I have mm-hmm. to go, I have to go today and tomorrow and Saturday or else I failed again at another goal that I set for myself. I think in certain aspects of life, you just learn to accept your shortcomings on some things, and they stop having that meaningful feeling. Like, you just, oh, one more thing that I suck at, but you don't really feel the the shame of not meeting a goal you set for yourself. Uh, I was eating Lay's potato chips last week. Serving on that is 15 chips. Whole chips, like 15 chips. Mm-hmm. Or as I call it, a handful. Yeah. And my bowl holds seven servings, I found out, because I decided... <laughs> oh, you decided to measure it? I have a specific snack bowl that I use. It's actually a Pyrex food storage bowl uh-huh. that I have lost the lid for. Don't tell my wife. <laughs> and um, that's what I eat pretty much everything out of. Ice cream, cereal. Mm-hmm. It's a multi-purpose bowl. Well, it uh, it holds seven servings of chips and uh, way more servings of M&Ms that I can count. Yeah. Um, but that's something that it's... It was hard for me to realize that, and harder so to enforce it. I I'm still str- I struggle with it every day. For me, Doritos and Cheetos were mm. were a thing. Love those, especially them little crunchy Cheetos. Mm. So, if I open a bag and I go sit down with it, and I'm turn on one of my favorite movies or one of my favorite shows, mm-hmm. and I'm eating it, it never once crosses my mind that. I should have only put a little bit in a bowl and put the bag away Mm -hmm. until I get to the bottom of the bag. Like, all of a sudden when you reach in and you're like, oh, crap, where did they all go? Yeah. And then you're at the, you look in the bag and you're like, oh, my God, the whole bag is about gone. And now I'm going to, like, pull it nice and tight so I can get every crumb. I am not leaving anything behind. That's snack shoot, of course Exactly. And they're so cheesy at the Uh end, like all them little pieces. You talk about lying to yourself and and, and telling yourself certain things. I just bought snacks that didn't have nutrition facts on the back. Mm -hmm. Serving size is whatever I eat. Yeah. Uh, Then you don't have to pay attention to it. You don't have to feel bad about it. My knee had Mm -hmm. gotten so far gone that I ended up having uh, orthoscopic surgery before I had my bariatric surgery. Okay. And the guy told me, he goes, when I got in there, I got to tell you, there was more arthritis than I thought I was going to come into. And unfortunately, what happens sometimes when you do this kind of surgery, you agitate it. And so this could be worse before it gets better. And that's actually when we really start talking about bariatric surgery because he's like, you've got to get some weight off because I am not replacing your knee. But you have an 80 year old knee i'm like oh my gosh so now here i am i'm down 130 pounds and my knee hurts every day i use cbd oil Mm -hmm. i use these pain and ointment creams and i'm so mad at myself because this is all me Mm -hmm. it's my it's my own fault like i have agitated this joint in my 38 year old body so bad that I've lost all this weight, and he just keeps telling me, just keep going, just keep going, it'll get better, just keep going. I can't go up a set of steps without like really thinking about it, because it's going to hurt. <laughs> a really bad tendency of writing checks, my body goes, you should do that, I do it anyways. <laughs> and it's my knees predominantly, when I'm going up the stairs, they, they, they hurt really mm. bad. I found a way to take the pressure off my knees and ankles by the way I go up and down, because if I just walk up and down flat-footed, it's like I weigh 900 pounds. It hurts so bad and everything. And I never realized I did that until my son pointed out that the way I go up and down the stairs, like, you do it goofy. I'm like, what are you talking about? I was like, just go up the stairs. And then I did that. And it was uh. like I was carrying a whole nother me on my back. And so now I make it a point to where I just go up the stairs like a normal person. I need to feel that. 
Right. I, I don't want to be in pain, but I need to be reminded that I need to keep trying to lose weight. Right. I need to be reminded that I, I'm this big. Mm-hmm. My body's got to work. I've got to work to lose weight, and I've got to work to be, to function. But with that, we are going to come back with a part two coming up. Make sure you watch for it. This was only part one. Oh, my gosh. Wait till you see what else we have to talk about. We'll see you back again soon. Make sure you click subscribe, ring the bell. Bye, guys. <laughs>